thank you to everyone at AII, W. Ella Joyce, who's, who's not here today. Small but, but incredibly effective team, so um, and we're delighted to be on the board. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Aboriginal land and pay my respects um, to elders past, present and emerging. Um, Sam and I were here about a year ago, and I feel like when we do that, when we say that, we immediately think, gosh, a lot's changed. Um, and I thought we might start there and then uh, bring uh, Doug in uh, to talk to us a little bit about why he's, he's joined the board and why it means something to him. Um, but Sam, in the most broad sweeping way, I guess, can you kick us off by saying what has changed in that last year? Because while we were having a very animated conversation about the territory that interests both of us so much and that we've spent so much time in, it was feeling very frustrating. I don't think it feels quite that way. Is that your, your take? Um, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and um, thank you, Julie. It's always wonderful to be here, and AIAW is, is certainly one of our favourite um, activities, and, and I'm so proud to be here in front of Eva. It's, um, Eve, um, it's been wonderful just to see your vision continuing and growing, Eve. Um, I just need, do need to start also acknowledging the country we're on, the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation, and paying my respects. I thought I'd reflect on the fact that um, what has, has changed in a year, I, I felt in Canberra in the days after the budget. I was in Canberra for the federal budget, but uh, June Oscar's first ever um, summit for 900 First Nations women from around the country was held um, in a much bigger venue, actually, than Parliament House in the Canberra Convention Centre. 900 First Nations women meeting for the first time, gathering together to create a, um, a pathway and a series, a systemic approach to um, gender equality for First Nations women. And, to sit and be invited to observe that underway and to see the power and the intention of those women, who I think will largely carry the vote if we are successful in the referendum, um, I think it will be the momentum that comes from a number of those First Nations women and the, the yarning circles they're creating around the country and talking about um, our civic duty and what we're all doing as people, but in their case as women, um, who have always led community. So um, I think it would have been hard to imagine a year ago an event of that scale um, producing the most extraordinary communiques. I'd encourage you to have a look at, um, at June Oscar's communique from that event. It was just outstanding. And all about economic justice as well, not just social justice. It was really powerful. Um, it was the best party ever, too. I don't know if you've ever been to a, a, a big party um, where um, a rapper's come along and Barker played, and it was, it was extraordinary. Anyway, um, the, the thing that has changed, I think, Catherine, is... Um, we, were, we were lamenting so many things that were still structurally wrong. And we were talking about the horrendous safety figures and the numbers of women um, that were still subjected to murder, to uh, domestic violence. Now, those numbers haven't really changed in that time, but the focus on, on domestic violence has again risen. Um, but we were also talking about the extraordinary gap between women's educational attainment in this country and our economic participation and a sort of a, a, a deep sense that we just were not we couldn't see the pathway really to closing that gap and utilising that incredible talent that Australia is number one in the world, the education of women. And so what has changed since then? Um, I carry my latest prop, which is the budget papers from uh, last week. So I, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I carry budget papers with me. Not only the women's budget statement, but also budget measures paper number two, um, which I've, I've, I've actually marked out for all the measures that are actually specifically for women because in this budget there's over $22 billion worth of measures specifically designed for women and girls in Australia. And that's a, that's a record for any budget process, federal budget process. Um, I think it takes its lead from many of the state um, uh, premiers and treasurers who were onto this, both the New South Wales and Victorian treasurers, uh, treasurers and education ministers were onto the um, billions of dollars of commitment to early education and care that happened before the, the election. Um, and that really gave, I think, the incoming federal government a, a sense that if the states were acting, the Commonwealth could also do that. So there's a lovely synergy there, I think, particularly with Victoria, where um, your additional preschool years and commitment to gender equality have been very strong and, and the work that Carol Schwartz did for, for the government here and the Treasurer. So um, but what has changed is we have a budget statement, which I thought, I'd just read you the opening, the opening co um, comment. Um, actually, you know, towards the, the top of what is this one? This is just... What I find incredible to be, able to be able to say this, this is signed by the Prime Minister, the Treasurer and the Minister for Women, who's also the Minister for Finance and the Minister for the Public Service. And they say, um, women's equality is at the heart of what we do as a government. It is essential for strengthening our economy, our society and our nation. 
a core test of the fairness of this country is whether we are a gender equal country. We will not achieve gender equality through a single budget or single reform. Driving real change in the lives of women requires ongoing leadership and commitment, and this government will continue that work towards making Australia a more equal country. That, that's signed by the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, and the Minister for Women. And I just think that's, a, that's, that's at the start of a budget statement, um, and it, all three of those um, leaders, together with their cabinet, had to gender lens every initiative over $250 million before the budget this time. That was also a first. So the gender responsive budgeting um, and taking us into account when thinking about measures is what led to $22 billion worth of, of measures, many of which are in the health field, including the decision to triple the, um, the Medicare rebate for bulk billing, which has a huge impact on women's lives. And that, that helped get that over the line for the health minister to be able to look at it through um, the women's health issues and their children. So. A lot has changed. These are, these are words that make us very, very happy, yes. aren't they? Um, but also gender lens um, and gender responsive budgeting. Couldn't be, couldn't be happier to hear um, that framework being mentioned and clearly at, at exactly the point that you want to mention. Um, Doug, can we go back a little bit? Can you explain your connection? And I know you've known Eve for a long time yeah. um, and why it was important for you to be involved in the work that we do. Oh, for me, it's a lovely story that goes back to um, Eve's contribution to the institution that I've been part of for nearly 40 years um, and her her role um, as the first woman board member of the institute. Um, a, a long time, to our shame, a long time before we had our second woman board member and we were a, a pretty old-fashioned institution and what I loved about Eve was her patience and... <laughs> Um, both with us as an institution, um, and you might think that's not quite the right word to describe it because she's a you know, force of nature and, um, you know, always hungry for progress. But for me, she's been very generous with us as an institution and with me as a CEO for the last 15 years. And Eve both supported us and challenged us, which I think is a wonderful combination. And there's probably been three parts to um, Eve's impact. And, you know, the first was really setting a challenge around gender equity of our workforce. You know, we medical research is unlike other STEM disciplines. We've had more women come in, coming into our um, field um, than men probably since the 1970s. And yet when I took over as CEO, we had no female professors at all out of so I sat in a room with 25 blokes, was, and that was 2009. And so, so the, the first issue, you know, that Eve, I think, has really pushed us to address is the, the, those core issues. How do, we, how do we become an organisation that has a level of decency? How do we, in, exactly as we've talked about as a nation, if we want to solve these in tr almost seemingly intractable problems in health and medical research like dementias and brain cancer and all of the diagnoses that we dread as, a, as individuals, families and communities, we need to tap into talent. Um, so that, that was really the first issue and we've gone a long way to doing that. We still haven't solved our, all of our challenges but we're on a path and there's a sense in which that's sustainable independent of the CEO and both a bottom-up and a top-down approach. So that was the first issue. And then Eve really set us the challenge of ensuring that the um, research that we do doesn't disenfranchise women in its application. And that's the crash test dummy yeah. anecdote. Mm -hmm. you know, and an example, we before you take a medicine from a laboratory and start testing it in patients, it has to go through animal testing. So we use mice. And there was a time where we used eight-week-old male black six mice right? because we wanted everything to be very consistent, which, of course, meant that the drugs that we were testing were never tested in female mammals. You know, things that we take for granted as scientists <laughs> but we'd never thought of from any societal practice. So there are, there are those sort of issues that we've been with Eve's um, encouragement have been confronting, and that's been fantastic. 
And then the third, the, the third element of that is to, to think of, and this is where I think the Women's Donor Network, AIW, has also come in, is um, we don't just receive philanthropy. Um, we support events. So we support panel discussions and we support conferences and we get asked to sponsor things. And then to be able to take the lens of a donor ourselves or a supporter and then ask how can we use that power to start catalyzing change in other organizations. Um, so th that's been the journey. Um, and Eve's been an incredibly generous mentor to me. Um, and I look around the room and I can see other women who equally have been patient and um, generous with their advice and their guidance, Julie included. And so when um, Julie called and said, would you consider this? It was easy. Um, it, it's the greatest privilege to be part of a board like this, but also be working with a group that I think ambitions resonate with me as a medical researcher. So it's this acute sense of wanting to do something today to change the world, which is exactly how we feel when we interact with consumers and patients. But an understanding that you need to be resolute and you're running a marathon and to actually change the world is often done in incremental steps. So you need that um, longevity of vision that's matched by a longevity of support from the people who support your organisation. And Eve's given that up to us um, as part of medical research. And I know that all of you are considering giving that to Julie and the team for this amazing organisation. Thank you. Um, and fantastic to hear all of that. We did want to make the theme of today um, about action um, yeah. because we've, we've uh, Julie and I, I always say, <laughs> Julie, the years that you have spent, but um, we've all tried as well to talk about applying a gender lens and making it clear what that means. So not just the theory, but how does that impact the outcomes? And I'm going to just go back for a moment, uh, Sam, to the budget, of course, the piece of research through equity trustees who funded us in a research program over the last um, two and a half years. Uh, one of the pieces of research with Deloitte Access Economics uh, called Breaking the Norm, which looked at the economic impact of breaking down those very binary gender stereotypes and came up with that figure, $128 billion added annually to GDP should we break down those gender norms. Tell us about where that popped up and, that, and what contribution that made because... I think we should we should all be very proud of the fact that that did make yes. a contribution. Yeah. Oh, thanks for bringing that up because I, sh I should have referenced that as being one of the signal events of AIW in between the one we did this year and when we met uh, late in the calendar year last year to launch the Deloitte work. Uh, that number was used immediately by Treasury. That was, it was interrogated. So there was a lot of, um, we wonder if that's true. It was interrogated um, to the point where Treasury and Finance began citing it as the rationale mm -hmm. for the uplift in productivity for the nation. It was the basis for the commitment to the gender equality strategy of the Commonwealth Government on the basis that we can spend good money uh, breaking down those gender stereotypes because the prize is so big and now being calculated by reputable sources and the stories told about how that plays out. So the stories inside that report about what that looks like. So, for example, men just, or boys, just not choosing to be in the care sector and how big the care economy is and that if we could encourage more men to be in the care sector and encourage the women who want to be in the non-caring sectors um, and to have big careers in those higher paying professions, that that crossover could actually achieve a huge amount of productivity uplift, um, income uplift for women particularly, but would equal out their notion of who cares, who does the caring in this country and who gets the pay payment for care I think we all care and we should not We should never not value the fact that caring is a, it's one of the most important things we do. But the economics of care is so strongly leveraged to women, 90, 95% of that caring in the paid, underpaid and undervalued area is done by women, aged care, um, early education care, disability care. And so the Deloitte report was able to unpack that to say, if you could break, if, if with government working with all other sectors could encourage a different look at what does gender mean in Australia today, when it comes to our pathways, our opportunity to earn, to save, um, to be equal parts of, a, of an economy and a community, then there was a huge productivity uplift. So, um, and when you hear the Minister for Women now selling the budget around the country, she starts her speeches with that figure. Mm -hmm. So she'll start with, uh, I, was, I was informed by the Deloitte 
work um, because now I know what I'm playing for and I knew as finance minister in addition to being the, the minister for women. So it's been profound. We've said this often to Julie that it, it's been a signal piece of work um, with, without which the starting point wasn't as clear. We kind of had kept advocating that, of course, gender equality would be good. Of course, there were these gender barriers. But until we put a number against it and we could verify that number, people thought our advocacy was interesting. But we sort of sat alongside a, a kind of a history of aren't we bad with this um, as opposed to now let's go after that $126, $128 billion worth of, of potential. So, again, it's cited in the budget papers. It's cited in the, in the Treasurer's speech. The Prime Minister cites it. So that, that number and that research now carries, in terms of action, yeah, it's a prompt to, to do things. It's, it's given the economic case. So um, I think we're very proud of it and the fact that we have supporters who have backed us in on a really important piece of work. And we're trying to get the Office for Women and Prime Minister and Cabinet to do a follow-on piece of work to actually get deeper and deeper into, into what that data could tell us about gender norms and, and how that's holding this country back. Yeah. And the practical applications yes. of the, yeah. how you go about that. Yeah. And there are wonderful examples. Uh, from around the world, in fact, um, but pulling that together, I think, would be enormous. I, mean, I think it, what it showed, and, and we often don't think about this, but we are, in, in addition to winning the number one in the world for women's education, and and at the moment it, we're, we're outstripping men in that 25 to 34 year old category by about 12 or 15 percentage points in terms of attainment of a yeah. tertiary degree. I mean, it, it's a staggeringly big amount of education that we do with women. Um, but what it did say was um, we have got such strong gender norms that we also win number one for most gender segmented workforces in the world. Yeah. So we just that this sort of 95% women caring, very few women in tech and manufacturing and, yep. um, and construction. And, and male breadwinner role. So but, it's very deeply embedded. Totally industry. embedded and women yeah. women as carer. And, and you see that in the life course of women that uh, women are paying the motherhood penalty. We don't have a parenthood penalty, we have a motherhood penalty. Yeah. Um, and we'd like to see it more as, as, a, as, as a subject for parenting so that men experience what it's like to take leave and so unless we get our paid parental leave systems right, unless we get superannuation paid on paid parental leave, these structural reforms yeah. are all contained within the report that shows just how segmented we are in the way we think about our roles in this country. And it, it just plays out over the life course. And so women then end up earning less, saving less, less superannuation, um, stranded. 60% um, of all single mothers today are women who had to flee a violent relationship and are now living in poverty. That's why they need a single parent payment. You know, they're not the, these tropes we've had about where women find themselves in our communities. It's just, it's antiquated. It's not borne out by what happens today. And, and that's another reason why the Prime Minister and the Cabinet were so clear about restoring dignity to single, single parents, 90% of them are women. So it's all bound up in the same story about how we think about our genders in this and, country. And some of us did that very good Incredible piece of work. The Paul Ramsey Foundation yeah. on that. Um, Let's talk about impact of philanthropy in um, medical research. Um, you've mentioned where um, the institute was some some decades ago. What's happening now, and where where can that be the most impactful? I guess in your arena. Um, I think I think there's a number of areas where, where philanthropy can have that great impact. Um, you know, one is backing women researchers. Yeah. So you know that, and that sounds. Um, that sounds easy, um, but having long-term support for particular programs, in, in research we're talking 5, 10, 15 years. We, we're starting to see donors like the Snow family, who are, Tom Snow is going to be part of this, um, this, this um, chat in Sydney, having um, philanthropists that are mandating that organisations are progressive in terms of the... the gender programs they have and are willing to fund researchers for eight years, often young researchers through eight years, often through juggling um, young children, is liberating because it means those researchers can think about the ideas about which they're so passionate rather than hustling for money all the time. And, you know, we estimated that that our researchers spend 30 to 50 percent of their time hustling for money. Could you imagine? I don't. This is an AFL town, so I don't expect either of you to be. Oh no, you may be. You're a Melbourne. <laughs> <Love story. laughs> um, <laughs> but could you imagine your full forward having to spend 50 percent of their time down the pub doing a chook raffle to get the funds to pay their salary, rather than practicing kicking goals? Right? We wouldn't accept that in a professional 
sporting team. I think we asked that about AFLW right. players. Uh, AFLW, they have to do <laughs> that, right? They do. They have the probably hustle for their money. <laughs> but for medical research, that's the norm. So having donors that are willing to liberate researchers, men and women, through the two times of their careers that are most insecure is fantastic. So I think that longevity of support, whichever area you're in, is is just liberating. And then the 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 next phase of that has been how do we use the money that we get and ensuring that there is really meaningful impact. So and that's that's also been an exciting journey and I, and it's become normalised where everybody in the institution is thinking about how they set up and design their experiments rather than having to retrofit things and that's been great. Yeah. Um, on the action front, I, th I thought it was worth also mentioning, given, well, it is almost exactly a year since the federal election and a couple of those programs, Pathways to Politics, which of course have been run here, um, and Women for Election, um, extraordinary impact, mm -hmm. um, you know, funded by philanthropy. Um, it made a tangible difference. I mean, those kinds of examples, we need we need a lot more of them, but they, they just show, don't they, the strength of what can happen when philanthropy applies that gender lens, but actually looks at where can we have some, some really significant impact. And then the, the, the ripple effect that that has back with government, when they can see the, the private sector and philanthropy making those changes, and we've seen that in health and medical research with the remarkable CEO of the NHMRC, Anne Kelso, um, who did something that no research funding organisation's ever done, and that's to say mm -hmm. there has been a systemic discrimination against women in the way they're supported in their research for 70 years. We're addressing it too quickly, so now what we're going to do from 2023 is allocate the same amount of money to female researchers and male researchers. We're going to run two separate races. Mm -hmm. and the quality will be fantastic. It's yeah. not an erosion of quality or merit or any of that nonsense. It is going to be a great outcome. And overnight, it has reframed the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I think your, your point about the support for the independence, I, I don't think there's any way we would be looking at the kind of reforms we're seeing today if it wasn't for particularly the women independents, and yeah. David Pocock has also been yeah. incredibly powerful. But their view about gender and equality from the time they took office has been just outstanding. And so you've got a, a government that still hasn't had a huge majority in Canberra. It, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, it, that, but a slim majority. And so in order to get their legislation through, they need the support of the crossbenchers. And when you have um, all of them, I mean, there's extraordinary women from Victoria, um, Zoe and, and others, um, who have just been quite clear, our electorates voted us in on gender equality, transparency and integrity and climate change, and we're just going to keep at that, which they have. So um, a government that's sort of looking around for how do I handle women in the budget or women in policy knows they've got a much broader audience they're now dealing with and has to worry about the movement of, of their traditional base to other independents. And Cathy McGowan said after the last election results, I think she was approached by 180 communities across Australia looking for the methodology to do independent um, representation and community representation. And at some point, they will be they, all those new um, um, political aspirants will be supported by philanthropy. And I don't just mean Climate 200. I mean, that was a particular story, and it had an edge on things, which I don't think was fair to the way that, that many communities actually chose their candidate on local community um, issues and ran on those things. Um, but there'll be others that will step up, I think, with significant funding because it's changed the parliament. It's changed the tenor of the parliament, the debates and, and how things come together so you can actually spend proper money and change policy and get it through the parliament. And what so, an interesting um, thing, uh, having been told for so many years that women lack, lack ambition, um, have no desire to step into politics, apparently lack confidence and so on. I mean, those things have been absolutely um, game-changing um, and apparently also a lot of younger women really interested so you know all those dire warnings that women would be turned off they wouldn't want to go into politics or indeed have an appetite for power yeah. um, and you've also had kate jenkins work with yes. um setting the standards so in addition yeah. to all of the other work she did that piece on the parliament so there's 55 million dollars in the budget for yeah. the culture change of the parliamentary system as it treats women and, and anyone who's different so yeah. the commitment to them actually bed that in and make sure that parliament is a safe yeah welcoming, inclusive place, I think we'll, we'll speak to those who, who probably said I wouldn't go into that toxic environment Indeed. Yeah. and now think of it as a, as a legitimate and good place to be. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so obviously some big change. All coming together. Um, 
let's, we will open up uh, very shortly, but just let's talk about the future. Um, but, you know, because it does feel as though this is a time of momentum, um, that there is absolutely appetite, that the whole idea of gender lens, uh, gender braining is starting to, to infiltrate. I mean, we see it here, uh, as Sam's read to us. Um, where to next? And, and maybe, Diane, tell us what would be helpful in, in your medical research arena. So, so for me, the where to next is how do we move from a reframe on individual projects to how we start reframing the system, yeah. which is the sort of stuff Sam is, has done so beautifully in the last months. And, you know, when I think about health and medical research or science or almost any institution that we value as a nation, you know, they've evolved over hundreds of years and almost all been designed by men and run by men for centuries. So how... You know, in, in science, you know, we think of science as being objective, but the whole way we do it hasn't been designed by women and, and is almost certainly not fit for purpose. So what I'm really interested in is how do we start, take a step back? How do we start unpicking things that we've taken for granted as the only way to be doing things? Um, and how do we create them afresh with a greater diversity of voices in their and, and hands in their design. I think that is it's daunting, but it's exciting. And the optimism, I guess, comes from the sort of demographic that I have at work, um, which is this amazing cross-generational coming together of you know, kids from 18 and 19 having their first taste of a res research environment to people that have been in the research game for six decades, it's like this room, right? It's the same excitement, it's the same vibe, and it's exactly the same reason that I'm just so optimistic, women in their 20s coming together with people like Eve, who's in her 60s. <laughs> 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 I'm <not> joking. <laughs> Sorry, That's why I she loves have... me so much. Right? <laughs> I shouldn't have laughed. No, no, sorry. Sorry. It's sorry. my birthday today. I'm telling I'm every birthday. inch of where I am. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention, if anyone's interested on that whole framework, um, there's an excellent book called The Inferior by Angela Sieni, who was the science writer at the BBC for years. Um, which, and the subtitle of it is How Science Got Women Wrong. Um, and it's an excellent read, and I quite agree with you. It opens up horizons that are enormously exciting. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll come at this from a couple of directions. One, I'll go back to my favourite, my favourite reading material at the moment. But I just want to read this to you because again, it's at the front of the budget, and it says that um, measures in this budget have had to consider gender equality in the policy development process, with key measures subject to a more detailed gender impact assessment. From 2023-24 MAIFO, that's the um, mid-year review which will happen in December, the government will extend gender responsive budgeting across the entire budget. This delivers on our election commitment and is central to putting gender equality and impact of women at the centre of budget decision making. Again, that, that's not a light statement. That, that requires the machinery of government to, to actually change right across um, the, the federal system. You'd hope that, that would also help with state governments and then um, might send a message to the private sector. Um, I, I said, if we have something to worry about, it's that government now understands this, has a mandate to do it, and I don't think we're seeing something as quite, quite as profound as this in, in the private sector world where I spend a lot of time. There's still lots of things said, but actually fundamental change of systems yet to come. So this is an important scene setter, I think. Um, but I think um, we, we've got to deliver our task force report to the minister. We had to deliver a series of recommendations for the budget, which we did, and, and we got most of our recommendations up. But we're, uh, we're delivering a proper report to the Minister in June, which looks at what are the long-term multiple horizons of change required in Australia to, to really build gender equality. And we've looked at it over multiple horizons, multiple governments, years, um, budgets, and said we said go very firm early on most disadvantaged women. So that's why single parents, uh, parents next, um, the things that were in the budget really dealt with those women who have done it tough. So um, we said start there, but then over time you have to look at these big systemic barriers that stop all women. And so we'll be reporting on that and show how that's done. We hope we, that we can show how it's done, but that's not just in this budget or this government, that that should be the long-term term ambition and probably is a 20-year project if we're honest about where the real movements will come so that we can guarantee a different start for young women across all the professions. But I'd say what, what gave me great heart in this, that not only was gender put across many of the, the big infrastructure spend, which had never been done, 
new things came forward. So in the women's health budget, um, there are now measures that actually represent new opportunities for women. Um, so there's a there's now a new MBA, PBS code for uh, testing for uh, breast cancer genes. And so that used to be a very expensive thing. Now you can do that on the PBS. Um, there's, a, there's quite a lot of money going into body image uh, as an issue for all women. There's lots of money going into, um, into the eSafety Commissioner for the treatment of women online, specifically for the, for the terrible treatment of women online. There's a doubling of the money on the National Plan to Eliminate Violence Against Women against a backdrop of community attitudes that still say we have got a fundamental problem about how we think about violence, with 40% of Australians still saying that women make up allegations of sexual harassment and assault for tactical advantages in relationships or work. So we've still got big waves of cultural change to come. But if you look at it over a series of things we can do as a country, then they're manageable, but it will require absolute commitment um, and, a, and a really significant focus. Um, I love the fact that in the I got to sit in the budget lockup for the second year in a row, which is is not a not a happy thing to do. It's three hours of just going through line by line before the treasurer delivers his speech. Um, but the one minister who came into the lockup was Mark Butler, the health minister, and we were talking about the number of things that are happening on the medical and health research side. We talked about the bulk billing side, and I, I sort of complimented him on the fact that women would get those longer consults um, for their children and for complex needs. And he said, "Yes, but you're missing my other." hope, which is that 60 to 70 percent of those GPs are women. And so I think this is a growing of respect for the women GPs who are never spoken about. And so you could see as the health minister, that conversation took a completely different turn to where even I was expecting it. He's talking about how he wanted that money to go to women GPs. And he was able to say why those GPs are, are, are less um, able to, to derive an income because they take more of those long consults without the subsidies because they think it's the right thing to do. And so it was a kind of, it was just nice to hear the language changing, and to know that that's what will that's what will be a feature of um, of future budget and policy making. Yeah, so, it's yeah. fantastic. And I, I was going to say, I think on the um, the business front, the you know, private sector, um, a lot of discussions now about the respect at work, um, the ramifications of the positive duty of care, yes. and, and so on, around creating safe workplaces. Um, and of course, next year we will see, due to amendments to the workplace uh, gender equality um, legislation, that there will be publication of the Absolutely. gender pay gap. So it's interesting that we will be seeing that, and I think a lot of businesses are now turning their minds to what both of those things mean. Um, and they're not going to deliver the instantaneous change, but the point is that you have to have all these pieces of the puzzle and coming alongside such a different approach to the budget. Well, they're going to apply that lens to procurement. Yes, so exactly. there, there's, there'll be a test, if you want to go and transact with government, yep. you'll need to show that you actually are meeting the That's Workplace right. Relations Act yep. requirements, that you have gender equality in your business, that you have a fair and decent place. So if, if not, the procurement part of the government yep. will say, well, we'll go with another provider. So there are, there are pressure points here that actually begin to, to have real um, impact way beyond the government, but That's government right. acting as a, government as a driver. Acting to reinforce that. Yep. And, um, but before we, we open up, I did want to, uh, rather quickly, but, but mention some of the other things that AI, I don't, I'm, there you go, i.e. Um, that we're doing. That we're doing. That we're doing. Uh, that we've well, been involved in. There was the, the housing um, research that we did, which, which landed with, with great impact, and we're also looking at following up on, um, and definitely um, may lead to, to, we hope, to, to some um, very... Obvious change, um, but also of course Mecca, and I know there's a lot of people here from Mecca today. Thank you very much, um, and we really um, have worked very closely with Empower. Julie's done so much work with them, um, and they're doing some incredible work, including funding a lot of uh, programs for women. Um, so that's fantastic. I mentioned Equity Trustees, and of course Perpetual um, and Cafe is here, and, and you know all the work that we do with these wonderful uh, people is is actually um, delivering great change and great action. So uh, we're very proud of that. I will now open up. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, questions, comments. Okay, introducing Amanda Millage. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I'm just curious to know how the 55 million will be spent trying to change the culture at um, Parliament House. I mean, how do you do it practically? Well, um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, one of the, the things that was absent completely at in Parliament House was a system of human resources. So it, it, was, it, it has traditionally been a, um, a huge building full of um, separately run small businesses. So the, the HR was done through the member or senator and their staff covered by a piece of parliamentary, an act that deals with that relationship. 
but no one looking after, there's no one you can take an HR complaint to systemically. And if you try to complain within your own little small business, you probably lose your job. And we've seen the evidence of that and where members of those staff have tried to bring issues and it just, it just doesn't work. So this is putting in a full human resources system um, that will look, uh, look at behaviour, fairness, um, and there's a whole lot of other measures in the education measures. I mean, we shouldn't have to educate people on how to provide a safe and, and inclusive workplace, but but it is a particularly bad one. And they, they'll do studies on whether to um, to get rid of alcohol during certain sitting periods, and they're going to have to do a whole lot of work because it has been a, a highly distressing place, not just for women, um, but, but many women have found it a very dangerous place to work and got very used to the, the preconditions and just signed up for it. Um, and so they've got a lot of work to do. That's 55 million over a number of years. It's not just in the, the next year. I think it's a four-year program. But they'll be employing people. They'll be running programs. Um, and they'll set up a system that actually says what it means to work in Parliament House um, and, and in the electoral offices. So it, it picks up um, all those workplaces. And I, I worked down there when I was in my um, late 20s. Um, and you did so at some personal risk as a young woman. I mean, they, they, what you hear about, um, most, most young women and a number of you know, really lovely men who were also subjected to, to horrible things would tell you what that environment was like. But it's uniquely about Canberra. And I, I used to describe it as a kind of arriving in a spaceship. You know, you, Canberra was quite normal. You'd go into that building and all bets were off, all the rules were off. And um, not with ministers necessarily, but the, the, the back bench, the, the stuff that would go on up in the media, in the press gallery. I mean, yeah, probably for a talk about that later. But they, they'll, they'll do a lot of things that will make it a much better place to actually do the work and um, and for every staff member in the parliament to feel that they're actually um, in a proper workplace. Sam, Doug, uh, Catherine, thank you. Um, and Julie, I, I actually think talking about the budget um, and the Deloitte report and the number of philanthropists, some of whom are uh, represented in the room today, who contributed to that report, um, the fact that that's had that type of impact I mean, hats, hats off, Julie, um, to Australians investing in women, because that, that is genuine genuine impact when we're talking about $22 billion directed to initiatives uh, for women and girls, which is fantastic. So congrats on that. Mm -hmm. just, just picking up on the, the sort of comment Sam dropped there around government is now making corporate Australia and very much so philanthropy in this country, look like a laggard when it comes to gender lens application in the work that we're doing. You and I were talking um, about a 12 month in review since we last had this type of conversation. And, and I had said um, 12 months ago, you know, we sometimes overcomplicate philanthropy. We know that investing in women and girls leads to um, really significant impact. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard in your role and the conversations that we're having across this room to get philanthropy to move on a gender lens and what's the call to action for us as a group um, around that particular issue now that government's moved? Well, I'll have a go, but I think um, Doug and Julie probably want to speak about this one. Um, thank you for calling it out. We, in our board meetings, we often mm -hmm. lament exactly this, that what more does an organisation like ours do to make the case for philanthropy. And it is stunning that it's now government that has, has set a, a new standard, I think, um, federally in that regard. But we do sit around and we look at the, the top philanthropy list and we think, yeah. why, why would this conversation be so hard? And, and we, we get all sorts of feedback that boards find it, that it's not right to do it, that they have their own systems, they trust their own systems, that they want to be pure and just deal with the issues that they might deal with, so whether it's climate or health, um, and don't want to have that other thing come in. And I think it just shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what Julie has been advocating for, Eve before her and, and everyone else. It's a very simple thing. It's a very simple thing to do. Look at your the money you have to give and applying a gender lens is simply saying, how can we make that work equally for women and girls as we do for men and boys? We've just got to do the analysis. Who are on our panels that determine where our money goes? If there aren't women on those panels, then we're probably making some fundamental mistakes. When we invite people to come in, do we have a... Uh, as the, the, the um, Medical Research Board does now, do we have a, um, a, a quota? Are we going to be comfortable with the word quota to say we'll give 50% to those things that will advance the cause of women? And what, if not, why do we feel that, that we're not in that game? Um, and I think that leveraging and being very intentional about it is what we've not seen. Some do it brilliantly, so there are some outstanding other examples of it. But as a, as a sector, we scratch our heads often wondering why it's so difficult and whether we're using the wrong language, 
um, or not making the case. And I think that's why the Deloitte work was so profound, because it put a number on the economic uplift of the focus. Um, I'd say no matter what government is doing, it doesn't mean that philanthropy or corporates are left off the, are off the hook. And I think it, it says even more so that the, the focus on, on gender has become more profound and the opportunity for philanthropy to do the kind of heavy lifting that almost no one else can do, um, put money to work that often in other parts of our economy can't do um, and, and really help direct that. So I just say there's that the prompt is if, if the federal government's now doing that and setting up a new standard, then I hope philanthropy sees that as a mark of something to aim for and to go go hard um, and be proud of it. And we were often talked about having a, um, a a top ten of the philanthropists in the country giving to women on the Fin mm-hmm. Review rather than just top ten philanthropists. So mm-hmm. call it and judge it and make it a make it a race to the top, if possible. Um, whilst respecting the fact that philanthropy is an act of generosity in the hands of people who care very deeply about the impact that you want to have. So it's not to be critical. It's to just add a, a layer to say you can do so much more with it. And we know that when you do it, it lifts, it lifts us all. And I think there is a moment in time with the government. Yeah. You know, so I think if we can, you know, if we can find ways to resource AIW, if we can find ways to now act almost, you know, from, from in my memory, a unique moment for Australia, then I think we can give tools to philanthropy and give for, co- tools to corporations that are, Know, giving to the community to allow them to think about these issues. Um, you know, two years ago, I think it would have been tilling pretty unfertile ground, but we do have this wonderful opportunity. So I think it's about you know making sure that there are the you know the people in in you know in your office that have that capacity to do it. To, and I might um, hustle. jump in and say, Kat, thank you for the question, and thank you also for your leadership. I think perpetual was the first of the large umbrella organisations to put a gender lens into all of your impact um, applications and that made a huge difference. I had people saying to me, oh, Julie, now we have to do this. And actually we're discovering some quite interesting things. Um, But to respond to your question and to add to what's been said, I think, you know, the people who are in this room are in this room because they care and because they get it and because they've listened. Um, it's actually needing some of the people in this room to speak to their peers who are perhaps not, uh, you know, either if they're really resistant are probably not wasting too much time, but there are people who I think are very open and haven't had the chance to actually have the one-on-one conversation. And I, I'm just looking at Jane from William Buckland Foundation who generously allowed me the chance to go in with one of the champions of change, Chris Maxwell, and speak to your board, and I think that made a huge difference. And thank you for the the grant that you've given us now to build some educational resources for boards and grant makers. But but my view is that we can do it if we get the chance to have a conversation. It's just how we get the people to engage. So sorry, um, Harriet, did you have a question? Um, thanks for a great conversation. Um, I'm Harriet. I'm the CEO of um, the Manafera Funding Collective, and we have the good fortune of partnering with Women for Election and other fabulous um, women-focused organisations, and so many of the organisations we fund are led by women. Um, And I guess listening to everything you're saying and some of the things that some of the women leaders will say uh, to me and to our funders is, how do we fortify this change? Because, yes, we're getting there and it's opportunities and there's promise and there's fantastic outcomes, but it could slip away very quickly too if we're talking about this government leading, this change in government or change in direction. And also, um, I guess, thinking about philanthropy in the broader communities, you could get a bit complacent that we've got the you know, greatest number of women ever sitting in our federal parliament, but that could change at the next election. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm just interested in your thoughts around how do you fortify this change that's happened and that's coming and how do we keep building on it? Um, it's, the right, it's the absolutely right question to ask um, because I think complacency is a... Again, another cultural attribute that we, we have. Um, Susan Ryan, when she was the first cabinet minister in Australia and minister for women and had the first women's statement in a budget under Bob Hawke, when she launched that in 1984, she said, the greatest risk we have is that we slip back. But despite that, so that was four, over 40 years ago, and that, that's what did happen. And there were successive moments where we could, we could articulate specifically difficult moments where things were wound back, but we had a man prime minister as minister for women might be the um, high point of that, some of that winding back or, or wondering what we were doing. But, but things did, did progressively get worse 
Um, violence got worse. The treatment of single mothers got worse. Uh, women's economic outcomes got seriously worse. Women's superannuation balances got away. We did lose attention and we let other things take its place. And so you're right, this is, this is a great moment. But I think it's, I hear Katie Gallagher now as the minister citing Susan Ryan in her speech to say, I don't want that in the next 40 years to be a, a rerun of what's happened in the previous 40. And so what we've got to do is we do have to lock it in and we do have to keep encouraging um, women to want to run for parliament, to want to be leaders of organisations, to, to move into the sectors where they can have the impact they've always wanted to have, where we sort out this caring discussion in the country, where we look at the care economy and we stop thinking about the fact that we, without women, um, either the underpaid workforce or the unpaid workforce, if they weren't around, our economy collapses. And actually looking into that and understanding what that means for our vibrancy as a nation and keeping that conversation and the tenor of it very high, um, holding governments to account on it, um, and it's not just the federal government, and this is a particular moment with a particular momentum, but state governments, local governments, corporates, philanthropy. I think, um, to Julie's point earlier, we have got to keep the, the tenor of the conversation high, um, and we've got to never forget that we're over half the population. Um, I, I still find it staggering that in most conversations where policy is being made, we are treated like a minority seeker of um, whatever we can get on the sidelines. We're, half the, we're over half the population and we're essential to the vibrancy of the future country. Um, and we're also key to dealing with the biggest economic changes that we're facing into on, um, on environment, climate, um, and rewiring the entire economy. And we can't leave women behind in that because that's where we could, we could do another spectacular 180. We could, just, we could just put all the money into the manufacturing and construction sector around climate change and leave women behind, leave science, leave, leave community behind. So, I don't have a specific answer. That is the work of all of us, um, to remain very attentive, um, push hard, support those new candidates to make sure that we've got the right people who want to be in those positions of power for the right reasons and then back them and then and start behaving, I think, as you were saying, you take this lead but actually all start living to a better standard um, and holding ourselves to account and measuring the impact and, and I guess understanding when we're having that slipping back. Catherine knows that through all your books that you've written about yep. language, about focus... Yep. Exactly. And it's never been about set and forget. And I think that there have been times where there have been, you know, a little bit of progress. But, I mean, Sam, the, the figures released last year by Chief Executive Women, which yeah. basically showed that we'd slid backwards on the number of women in CEO positions, for example, in the ASX. Um, there's a number of other markets, and I, have, again, have been looking at this in great detail in the last few weeks. And um, it's disturbing. And it's around the world. Um, and it's just... It, it, it's. It is quite well, we're genuinely seeing, worrying. And there we're are seeing, fewer women. And we're seeing leadership. one back of reproductive rights. I mean, it doesn't just go to the things we're talking about. The, the assault on women, um, particularly out of the United States and other parts of the world, you know, that, that can creep into the mm. Australian environment. We see it in certain parts of the discussion um, about around trans women. Around It's on, it's yeah. on every level as an attack that if we're not, uh, we're not acutely aware of and, and engage, and we engage with the right community, with younger women, with, with people who are diverse, um, and make sure we're having those conversations everywhere and remaining terribly alert. I think that's that's our job as as citizens, and I think we have to be really good citizens to, to do that and know what's in it for all of us. But if we get lazy, we are complacent. Um, well, that's right, and that's why it's so important, the data and the evidence, and um, I'll, I'll hark back to the research program that we've been running. I mean, there is nothing like that for actually making sure that you can continue that progress and hinge um, action off it. And, um, and I think that we have wonderful institutions here, um, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, um, you know, the Human Rights Commission and so on. Um, we're tracking it quite well, but Michelle Ryan from the Global Institute for Women's Leadership would say the same thing. One of our problems is um, organisations of all kinds are rather over-optimistic about this. And I wonder if that happens in philanthropy as well. So actually, haven't we talked about this a lot? Aren't we already... Just by default, aren't we serving women and girls really well? Yeah. And I think that that's why we have to keep our eye on the ball, um, exhausting as and, it is. And there are false positives too because yes. and things that we always champion. So I, we were talking before we came on the panel that the majority of chancellors around the country are women today, university chancellors. And you could look at that as if that represents the entire university sector and say, we've done. Women have achieved great greatness. But look at the passage of women. So those women are often brought in from the outside, from different industries. They're magnificent women. And they're fixing a balance there, but they are not, they're not the outline, they're not the outrunning of a program that has seen women do well in academic. And your point about how many great researchers lose everything by having children, um, stop at mid career, never ever um, get into a senior academic position. But we allow ourselves that we're the kind of, um, it's, it's a lazy thing to sit back and say, but look at all those great women leading universities, we're done. 
Mm. And that's that false hope, I yeah, think, that yeah, we're, we're done here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you talked with, at the task force, we spoke to women all around the country about the life course of women in this country. And when you really get into it, in every conversation, women face this significant series of barriers at every part of their life. And until we understand that, I mean, you're lucky to get through and to, to have equality, um, or you make choices about mm. your life that, that mean you miss out on other things in order to retain your, your seniority. So um, we've got to be listening and, and paying attention to women and men. And you're great men. I don't want to exclude men from the conversation mm. at all, but this is fundamentally about mm. how, how quickly things have slipped back for women. Yeah. I really like something you said about the situation in the US that, you know, really has come about through this sort of hyper-polarisation. And, you know, when I think about how we might maintain the sense of optimism, it has to be by embedding progress across the political spectrum and avoiding um, a sort of othering of an entire group and rewarding the small wins when it might happen on the right. Um, you know, I, I really hope we can do that. You know, almost it's almost Darwinian if we can encourage some wonderful women to be in safe National Party and Liberal Party seats, and they get elected, then we're going to see that progress embedded. But at the moment, you know, the hyperpartisanship I think doesn't do anybody any justice. Could, could I, I would just like to make a comment to about um, going to move away from um, from what you were just saying. Um, uh, sorry, just got Dark. 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 Mm-hmm. Um, uh, to go back to the issue around philanthropy. But I just also want to pick up on that reference to Susan Ryan. I can't believe that it's as long ago mm. as that. I um, I was around in in my um, work um, in a professional career at that stage. And when Susan Ryan came in to that position, she did so much for women. I mean, the, the number of women who were my colleagues, I was working at the Australia Council at mm. the time, who were my colleagues, who were appointed onto all sorts of boards, commissions. It was just amazing to see. I mean, I had the opportunity to be involved with the Australian National Commission for UNESCO at that time. Um, an incredible opportunity. Um, a lot of women got those sorts of opportunities at that time because of what she did. But just to get back to philanthropy, I think the issue about philanthropy is that now is the time for philanthropy because I think philanthropy is really now starting to look at systemic change. Um, the, the whole rationale, the whole um, sort of philosophy around philanthropy has changed dramatically. I would say over the last five to ten years, and I've been involved with the Buckland Foundation for um, quite a long time, and I've watched it evolve. And the attitudes that were prevalent um, some years ago no longer are. And so I think that the time is right for actually getting a lot more engagement from the philanthropic sector. For a long time, it really was a bit of a boys' club, and I think we just have to recognise that. And we have to say that things are changing and that's good and we need to really be able to work on that, maximise it and actually look at how that can stop that backward slip too because I think that philanthropy can be a very powerful Mm. um, uh, agent for change. Can I also just say about the environment because I noticed that Amanda is here and I'm also very supportive of the work that Amanda um, does at the... um, uh, at the Australian Environmental Grant Makers Network. The number of women working in the environment field is just stunning, and they're wonderful. They're young, energetic, vital, really incredible women. And so I think that there's a really wonderful link between a- AIIW and AEGN that you should perhaps be looking at and how you can maximise their I couldn't agree more, Jane. Thank you very much. We've got a couple of other treats for you, um, and I'm going to, uh, with permission, um, bring that question time to a close, but we, there will be time to have one on one questions later. I guess when I was sitting there, I just, um, I have to say, my heart feels very full, and I just think, how incredible are these people? I really want you to just take a moment to say that.
but we do want you to stay there if that's okay. Um, there's a couple of things that I just wanted to add. Um, I know, Doug, um, we said that we would take the bios as read, but I do think it's important to point out, point out that this wonderful institute is Wing High, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, for those who don't know. <clears throat> and I think our first gender-wise uh, philanthropy award went to the Dyson Trust for funding or co-funding um, the childcare centre so that um, there was support in place for women researchers. So, you know, you've been at this a long time, Doug, and I really take my hat off to you. Um, Thank you, Joy. There's a couple of things. Um, the, that we call today evidence to action, and it's really about, I think, the power of this incredible research program that under the leadership of the board we've adopted and thanks to the Bell Family Foundation um, who fund that and actually have gone a step further and funded a communications person for us because they were very um, aware that we were doing a lot of work and not always able to communicate that. So I really want to acknowledge that. Um, mm, there's so many things I could say, but there are two people, actually three people in the room I want you to hear from, and they're not going to have very much time, but they have a lot um, of wisdom to share. I'm going to start actually by inviting Jason Franklin to the mic. Um, Jason is here doing a sort of whirlwind tour. Um, he's an incredible international leader. Um, please come up, Jason. Uh, and I'm almost embarrassed that I'm going to say, you know, we've got like three or four minutes because... <laughs> I then want to invite um, one of our not-for-profit leaders and one of our donors to say a few words before we um, close up. So time is ticking, but um, for a global <laughs> perspective, um, please, Jason, um, please make him welcome. Well, thank you, Julie. I will try to be quick. Julie knows I could sit and talk for like five hours, so but I won't do that. Um, as Julie said, so I... Uh, in engaged in social change philanthropy across the US. I've been coming to Australia now annually since 2016. And some of the comments even just earlier today about what's been happening in the US, I think are really worth paying attention to in the Australian context. Um, the first we often say in the US is the demographics are not destiny. Mm. And it has been part of the complacency of the progressive movement across racial equity or gender equity around LGBT equality to see the idea of demographics somehow equally destiny that we are the women are the majority of the population and with increasing leadership now we're finally seeing recognition and therefore we will continue to move forward that the LGBT community has been achieving greater equality and therefore will continue to move forward and instead what we see is that as more greater equality is realized the pushback also gets stronger and we have seen the co-optation of women and LGBT and leaders and people of color to become outspoken advocates against equality. And it further complicates the conversation where you have, you know, uh, women for traditional values is one of the groups in the U.S. where you have women calling for the repeal of gender equality laws because they undermine women's rights in their frame of what it means to be a for women's rights. And I've heard, and there's been talk about some of the same funders who are funding that hateful work in the United States, funding that work here in Australia, mm -hmm. right? Acknowledging that trans rights are women's rights and that defending the lives of trans women means defending gender equality and not allowing the use of the intersection or the wedge issue of fighting and marginalizing trans people to break apart the advocates for gender equality. That has been the playbook in the United States and that is being exported all over the world. To use the wedge of racism and to talk about immigrant women versus Australian women being justified to be treated in different ways as a wedge issue to break apart the, the coalition of those who are fighting for gender equality. So I think it's really important as the kind of next iteration is going to be the pushback, right? It has been a generation of work to get the recognition, to see the goals in the federal budget, to see the advances, and every advance engenders more pushback and to be prepared for that. Otherwise, because we've seen it in the US where groups got complacent. You know, the, the statement from um, the 80s of not letting it 
fall away. We've seen it over and over uh, in the US, in Europe, all around the world. Um, the question, two more things I would mention. One is around uh, make, how do we make the work stick, the question earlier. I think part of it is we forget or we're not willing to be as pragmatic when, on, when we're fighting for equality of what it takes to make it stick, of putting it in the Constitution, of put it in, putting it in the bureaucracy, of putting it in the metrics that are used to evaluate government funding. The more we can embed the details of what it means to realize equality and the infrastructure of our economy into the processes of our politics, the harder it is to take it back out. We all know how hard it is to write a new bureaucratic form. So let's write better bureaucratic forms that make it harder for the right to rewrite them. And there's really, there are tactical ways. We've been, I've been doing work in the US with a bunch of democracy advocates to talk about as we flipped certain state legislatures, how do we embed voting rights more deeply into the process of government? How do we embed protections for people of color and protections for women more deeply into the government? Embedding it deeply keeps it there longer. And it makes it one less thing you have to fight for. Um, and then the last thing I think on the philanthropic side is to change the, the norms of what we're pushing for. You know, I've been uh, talking with people over the last two weeks being here about how we need to set a lot of our practices not as best practices, but as good practices. Yeah. I mean, the baseline is to be funding gender equity rather than the goal is to be funding gender equity. The baseline is to have gender parity rather than the goal of achieving gender parity. And it, it's a linguistic importance to shift the dynamic. When you say this is where we everyone should be starting, those who aren't there go, oh, we have to catch up to where everyone's starting versus <laughs> celebrating that you finally put one woman on your board. Like, well, when you get to five, then we will celebrate you out of eight. But you have three more slots before you get to be celebrated. You know, the shifting the bar of what we expect changes the dynamic of what people see as success. And so we don't say, oh, we've got university chancellors now as women, therefore we're done. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to be a professor and I remember my first day at the university that I joined and I asked about diversity in our faculty and the white straight male chair said, oh, we're doing great. We've got you and Michaela so one queer man and one woman of color, and therefore they were doing that. <laughs> um, but that was, and people nodded when he said that. Right? We have to change what it means to be doing great, so that way when we get to something that is just doing okay, we can say we've still got more to go. If I just say something, oh, I think I turned this off. I think it's on. Um, thank you for those those words. One of the things we learned through the task force when we looked at what had happened in the US was, and you, and you said it, that conservative forces take a very long term view of success. Um, and I think the, the stacking of the US Supreme Court was a 50 year project. Yeah. It didn't happen under Trump, it was building and building. But those that the more progressive, those that believed in a better world, for the reasons we do, had taken their eye off, off that process completely. And so your point about systems and embedding things, getting them into law, um, and not just seeing the top line things of what we're doing as success is so important. And we're, we're susceptible to that here. And we've seen that in the, the work we've been doing on our task force, um, very much that people get very excited about what's happened and they are forgetting about um, what else is coming and the, the long conservative game that is actually around us all the time. Yeah. And Jason, thank you so much. You've been an incredible mentor to so many people in Australia in philanthropy and certainly to me and was at the beginning of Boulder Giving, which led to women moving millions and various things in the state. So I really thank you so much. Um, it's reminded me what you've said, Jason, of a story that I just want to briefly share about ANZ because we've got a couple of people from ANZ here in the room. I had a chance meeting with Shane Elliott at the tennis one day and said, look, you know, you're doing incredible things at ANZ uh, in promoting gender equality and they'd been a big part of Champions of Change. And I said, does that value for gender equity flow onto your giving? And he went to say, oh, yes, of course it does. And he really thought hard and looked into the middle distance and sort of said, actually, that is a really good question. Uh, I'm going to chase that down. 
And he actually did. And I, it would take too long to tell the story and we've got a case study and development about it. But it was really him saying, look, what matters gets measured and what's measured gets managed. If we, he did an investigation and said, actually, we're pretty good in our giving when it comes to equity. But actually, it's not been by design necessarily. It's been by default and we can't afford to let that happen. Um, so that's the kind of response and, and one of the reasons we're so happy to work in to be working with Doug is that he is a member of the Champions of Change Coalition and we want to get those processes embedded in corporates. Um, I've got so many things that time is disappearing. Um, I have invited Jeanette Large here because one of the reasons that Eve um, created this movement was, yes, to change the philanthropic flow of funding, but it was essentially so that that funding did better things in the social sector and helped, I think I remember you Eve saying you were so frustrated, not just by the waste of talent, but by so much great work being done by women's organisations that simply wasn't getting attention and funding. Every so often when I'm despairing of how slow the progress is, um, Jeanette reminds me that it has made a bit of a difference. So I'm just gonna ask you to make a brief comment, um, Jeanette, if you're happy to come up. Jeanette runs the Women's Property Initiatives and um, that's a key organisation working um, to provide safe and long-term housing for women in Victoria. Um, and Jeanette, please, just, just for a minute to talk about what difference AIW's work has when it comes to not-for-profits like yours. Thanks. Thanks, Joy. I'm just talking to you. <laughs> um, look, it, it really has. It started off um, uh, as Women's Donors Network. I was actually working at Women's Property Initiatives for a few years before the Women's Donors Network was uh, even existed. And um, so Women's Property Initiatives, it was established uh, because of the disadvantage um, that was noted by Women Before Me that started the organisation in relation to women getting access to safe, secure and affordable housing. And that was very much because of the financial disadvantage. The disadvantage that you've, you've outlined um, and we continue to outline um, regularly uh, of why women aren't discriminated against but have that financial disadvantage in, in accessing housing. So the work that um, Australians investing in women have done, the Deloitte work you've, you've referred to tonight, the per capita work, the fact that you've actually set up now the working group uh, around housing, it, it's definitely had an impact on... Um, on I can see for our organisation it's had an impact in relation to philanthropy and while you say not enough of the philanthropic organisations have actually taken on the gender lens yet, several have and it has made an impact for our organisation but it's also really made an impact for government. So those sorts of reports have really had that impact on government. Now if we're going for government tenders, yes, we have to actually say around um, the social procurement has, there has to be a gender lens on that. There has to be um, uh, several um, special projects that are specifically for women's housing through government, that are funded through government, for women escaping family violence, that are funded through government. So the impact that the work that this has had, the research work that this has had, the fact that Australians investing in women have, I know, constantly been out there talking to other philanthropy organisations trying to get that gender lens, we, our organisation, has seen that impact and it's been terrific. And, and for me, from having been at the organisation now for many years and before um, the Women's Donors Network and Australians Investing in Women uh, existed, there has been a change and I think it's terrific. And even tonight, you know, having, having sessions like this tonight uh, are really really positive. Working in an area of housing at the moment, it's pretty mm -hmm. catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, so coming to a session where we can see some positive outcomes, <laughs> at least in relation to gender equality um, and, you know, people in the room who are prepared to continue to uh, forge ahead with that is, is just terrific. So thank you. Well, thank you very much.
Jeanette, you're an absolute stellar example of women supporting women and um, you are one of the people I think about when I think, okay, we really have to keep doing this work and you've been at it for a long time and doing a great job, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm going to make a few more remarks and then I'm going to um, refer you to some of your paperwork and I have one more guest that I'd like to make some uh, observations. But um, it is a very heartening time to, to hear you know, what's happened and I really want to recognise that it was Catherine Fox that actually tipped us into that Deloitte Access Economics uh, research and the good thing about it, not just from our participation, but it was that the head of Deloitte Access Economics turned to the team and said, we really should be looking at a gender lens across all of our research, not just this, um, and really thinking about philanthropy as a key, key lever. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and, you know, I'm very pleased that we live in Victoria where we have a Gender Equality Commissioner, we have um, a Gender Equality Act, um, and in many ways we do lead the world, actually. When I was on my Churchill Fellowship, it was often recognised that we were doing so much. But... Um, it, it's up to all of us. Um, I know we're getting some cut through when you do a search on chat GPT and um, a lot of stuff comes up about being gender wise. And that is a, a term that we coined a few years ago, really to recognise that it's not just about doing the right thing, it's about doing the smart thing. It's, it's really about wisdom. Um, I want to just very quickly, um, I guess, reflect on those lovely comments and say we are a very mature organisation now. We're very strong and stable. We're incredibly well led uh, with our board and we have a fantastic now expanded team. We are 2.8 people, <laughs> um, which is like, it's amazing. Uh, and it's really just wonderful to have you with us, Ella. And I'm sorry Joyce isn't here tonight. I know she would um, be enjoying this. Um, but many of you have commented over the years that we're a lean team and we punch well above our weight. Um, we absolutely won't be changing that. We will continue to give 110%. What we're really asking for you to consider and for people that you might be talking to in philanthropy is how we can get a bit of a runway so that we're not having to worry about covering our basic operating costs, our salaries. Um, that expanded team does make a bit of a difference when, you, when you're looking at the cost of keeping the doors open and the lights on. So. It's really about the stuff Doug was talking about. You don't want to spend any not-for-profit knows this. It's always a bit of a, um, a, a juggle, but it was such a relief. So many of you after last year's event did convert to multi-year funding, and it's just allowed us to lift our game incredibly and, not, and focus on the real work and the impact. So I just really want to thank you for that. And I'm going to give you a bit of a top-line summary of some of the things that we are working on. Um, we're working in partnership with Philanthropy Australia, um, including on the Eve Marlab Genderwise Philanthropy Award, in hiatus this year, but coming back um, next year. Uh, we have a three-year research program now in its third year, and we're very hopeful that Leonie Bell will continue to fund that because it has been an absolute um, powering of, of change. We are in a significant collaboration with the Melbourne Social Equity Institute at Melbourne Uni uh, to develop a, a resource that actually helps in some of the bigger partnership work. So we've got our toolkit and our guide for philanthropic giving, but actually a lot of the real change and the systemic change is now happening with the big players, big dollars and big collaborations, and there isn't something that we can give to those people at this point. So we're developing that framework and using housing as our case study. And my dream, while all of this money that is being talked about going into housing in the next few years, everyone we're speaking to and sharing the resource with, including government, is very quick to say they do not have a roadmap or they don't have uh, a gender lens. Um, with some exceptions, I'd say in Victoria, where we do have um, our commissioner and the, the gender impact assessment requirement, but um, it needs to be strengthened in, and we're working with um, with Housing Victoria. Um, thanks to the William Buckland Foundation, we are developing a new set of gender-wise educational resources for boards and for grant-making teams. We've done that very well, I think, over the years, but we're really um, very much on the fly and on the smell of an oily rag. So we're investing now in some really good um, contemporary digital resources. 
Uh, we've produced an advocacy kit that we're going to share later in the year for people like yourself who then want to talk to other funders or other not-for-profits about um, thinking about gender in the design and delivery of their work. And we continue a regular series where um, instead of having 20 people ask for a cup of coffee so that they can learn more about how they might find funding for their brilliant young women's organisations, we um, have a monthly session where we do a virtual coffee for not-for-profits and help them understand the landscape. So we're, we're continuing a whole lot of stuff in the background, but we've got some very big um, projects. And one of them, and I'm thinking about your comments on the gender pay gap, one of them is a new survey. And lots of you helped us, and Ashley, I really want to call you out because you've been fantastic in helping with us piloting the survey. But what we've got is a survey that we're sending to the top 50 private and the top 50 corporate philanthropists and they're the ones published by the AFR. Now some of them are in the tent already and some of them we talk to but a lot of them will not have necessarily engaged with us. So the first time we'll be asking people to really quantify their gender giving and longer term we'd love to be able to do that work that you led so well at CEW and actually put a different ranking and say so let's look at the top um, 20 gender-wise funders and celebrate that. So, um, and, and of course, working with Doug to roll out our new resource that we developed with the Champions of Change for, for Corporate Giving. So lots of things, um, I'm not even going to go through all of them, um, except to say we really want to strengthen our focus um, on some of the issues that Jason mentioned around um, intersectional gender lens and really make sure that we're not just looking at gender as a standalone, but actually as a foundational lens um, that works with many other intersecting factors. So we're very grateful to you um, for your support and for your interest and your care. I want to just draw your attention to the beautiful purple document that is um, on your lap that summarises some of the things that we've been talking about and help might help you, I think, in considering... Um, how you might get involved with us in the future. We've got a little notebook for you there and I'm really hoping that you might take a moment to have a look at the invitation we have now to, for you to interact with us. Um, and really, uh, uh, we won't be frisking you on the way out, but we do want to make sure that you take a moment to fill out that form and leave it... Um, there was a glass jar there. Leave, leave it in the, um, the glass bars that is at the end of that bench, or was at the end of that bench. Um, and so if I can ask Ella, perhaps, um, there is, I don't know if you need a pen, but what I'd really love you to do is pull out that little form, have a think about how you might like to be involved with us. And there's also an opportunity to give us some feedback. And while you're looking at that and thinking about it, I'm going to invite... Um, one of our wonderful donors, um, and I will say for full transparency, someone who's become a very dear friend and a mentor, introduced to me by Siri Rinkin, um, another former board member of Australians Investing in Women. And um, if I could ask you, if you need a pen, happy to grab one, but it's just to give us a little bit of an indication of how you might want to work with us going forward. Um, and Min Bartlett, if I could invite you to the microphone. Thanks, Jules. <clears throat> Thank you for the panel. It's been absolutely inspiring. So uh, we've decided to double our donation this year and uh, Jules just asked me to speak a little bit to that. So there are a couple of reasons why we chose to do that. Firstly, at the macro level, which some of you have just articulated so beautifully, with the erosion kind of, of women's rights and girls' rights across the world, particularly in America, our reproductive rights, the prospect of Trump coming back into power and what that will mean for us, the LGBTI community and so many other communities as well. Um, the increase in toxic masculinity fueled by the likes of Andrew Tate, the increase in kind of violent pornography and the impact that that's having on young, young girls and women. And so there are so many other things that at the macro level, I feel that the work of AIIW is needed and you know, now more than ever. So that's kind of the bigger, biggest piece. And then kind of the work, the work you do, Jules, and, and you've spoken so beautifully, Sam and the rest of you, about the impact of the reports you do and how that's actually creating 
changes in policy, you know, the law and then increase in funding. So that's just incredible. Um, and we know that it's so hard to actually find funding for advocacy and um, that Jules does all this with her incredible team on the sniff of an ORAD. The other thing for me is that I'm actually very passionate about gender equality and work in the women's leadership space. And yet I needed a challenge and question from Jules about what gender lens I was applying to our philanthropy. And it was only when she asked me that that I actually realised that. And so, for example, when we make our yearly donations to the ASRC, the Salem Resource Seeker Centre, Salem Seeker Resource Centre, we were able to ask, well, how is this benefiting women and girls? And yet, despite all my knowledge and my passion, I'd never thought to ask that. Oh. Finally, let's face it, Julie is a powerhouse. <laughs> she is just creating so many wins in this space. She's lifting up and supporting so many other not-for-profits doing, you know, this type of work for women as you beautifully attested. She's wise, she's so devoted, and she brings her full heart to everything she does. So for all of this, we are just so honoured to be doubling our donation this year to Julie and her incredible team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that is um, both beautiful and incredibly uncomfortable um, to listen to, but I really appreciate it. Um, I am so grateful to you, and we are mm, just after six o'clock, I promised uh, we would let you go. I really want, uh, again, to thank everyone who has come along. Um, I really want to invite you to stay around and please eat some cheese and biscuits and have some wine and cheese. And we can all sing happy birthday to you, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Not right now. I mean, it was, it, it's, it's, it was wonderful. It's always wonderful of you to be here. We have actually given Catherine a bit of a Mecca voucher to say thank you because Mecca supports us, we support Mecca. Yeah. Um, and um, Sam, I really just want to say thank you. Okay, humility will take over, but we are so very, very, very lucky to have you. I've had many a not for profit say, Why did you think her to be here? <laughs> and I'm like, Long game, long game. <laughs> um, and same with Fab. So I really want to say thank you so much to the three of you and to you, Kathy, for your brilliant leadership. And Steve, off in the Sulawesi waters. Uh, and also, I really want to thank Joyce who's not here, Ella, who happily is, um, Claudia, who's come in and volunteered to serve you some drinks, but at least I know has not um, And to all of you for all that you do, I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. And thank you for what you're doing in your own world around gender equality. Mm -hmm.